Hello, how are you doing? I hope you had a chance to read some good things in the month of June. I read quite a few books. Um, some of them I absolutely loved. Uh, one I'm still feeling quite confused about, not really sure how I feel about it, and there was one book that I did not finish. Um, so I'm going to go through and discuss all of the books uh, individually that I read this month. Uh, starting with Mischief Acts by Zoe Gilbert, uh, which is such a creative and a uh, really enjoyable book. So it's framed around this figure from English mythology uh, called Hearn the Hunter, uh, who first appeared in literary form in Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor, uh, though I think, you know, he existed as a figure of folklore uh, that was sort of discussed in, uh, in communities uh, before that. And he is a figure that uh, that is said to have horns growing from his head and he rides on a horse and he causes mischief and so it follows uh, his his tale in the very beginning in the 1300s she kind of creates an origin story for him uh, but then you follow his his spirit or this figure uh, through the the centuries and many different stories of characters throughout English history and so focusing on their different stories in different periods of time so it is kind of like a book of short stories in that in each successive chapter in each different time period you have a different set of characters and uh, and you have to reorientate yourself to this this new situation but Hearn the Hunter appears in their story in some form and he takes many different forms over a period of time uh, from a, a man to a woman uh, to a flock of birds and uh, also he is pursued by this vengeful magician so their drama is kind of played out over the centuries while also following these individual tales. So it's quite a complex structure and it's so in inventive uh, though and, and so enjoyable to, to read. And uh, each, each chapter um, takes a different form. I mean, some of them are kind of more traditional narratives. Some are kind of journal entries or, or letters. Um, some are told in song. And uh, so, so it's very creative in that way as well. And actually I read a physical copy of this alongside of listening to an audiobook like when I was walking out and about I would listen to an audiobook and then I would I would stop when I was at home I'd read the physical edition and actually the audiobook was really wonderful to listen to because it had a number of different performers uh, reading different sections um, so in utilizing different voices but then some of the the parts are in song so were actually performed in song in the the audiobook and uh, it, it, it's so good um, the, those parts and you know really bringing those sections to life. So yeah, it's really creative and, and wonderful and I really admired this. It's a very different form of writing than uh, a lot of other fiction that, that is coming out. So I think it's so bold and inventive how this author is doing that. But at the same time, because it is you know kind of like short stories, inevitably some of the sections I think work better than others or at least struck me more than others or that I wanted to stay with them and know more about these characters stories uh, and then it might go on to a section which you know I didn't enjoy quite as much and so would have that kind of thing of being a bit resentful of having to to leave uh, some of these stories but behind uh, so yeah there were some sections where there that I thought were the strongest of uh, there's a section about kind of wood nymphs and and like gossiping forest spirits um, that that was so enjoyable and fun and uh, there was also a section of a very pious uh, religious man who's trying to institute uh, morality in his community even though his his uh, his community around him kind of descends into debauchery and his frustration uh, about that I, I just think is so funny and, and well observed I mean he's a very likable man but he's just sort of it just all falls apart around him and there's the kind of pleasure in in following that uh, there's another kind of more modern section about the uh, difficulties of this relationship that gets into some issues of sexuality and and the the closeness or partness in our relationships and what we understand about our partners um, I thought that was really well done and uh, also it goes into the future into this kind of ecological 
disaster and and following how uh, society shifts and changes in in the future so so yeah there's a lot in this book and and also I think in some sections the integration of Hearn the Hunter works well than in better sec in other sections but uh, but but yeah at the same time that the entire book is this wonderful creative feat that is so enjoyable to read. And then I tried to read Antonio by Beatriz Bracher. Um, I, I mean, I, I got a good way into this novel, uh, which uh, is by a Brazilian writer, and it's following a, a man named Benjamin, um, who's just about to become a father, but then he uncovers this shocking family secret uh, about his lineage and uh, and so then he tries to understand uh, more about his past and his family um, through talking to some members of his family and people that that knew his his father and grandfather and uh, and so he has to try to piece together the the story of what really occurred and what went on in his family and I love the idea of that that structure I, I think that's very poignant and and moving but then the actual experience of reading this I got so confused that I just felt a bit lost in in the story and really couldn't understand and there were there are quite a few characters and I just they, they were getting a bit mixed up for me and uh, and I think even though the 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 chap chapters are quite short and their sections are are quite short even though it goes back to some of the same characters at different points and uh yeah so it just felt like a very elaborate puzzle and i just got a bit lost in it and so frustrated by it and um and felt like i wasn't getting much out of it because i was so lost so so i felt really bad about that i i but at the same time i I just knew this um, this reading experience wasn't working for me. I mean, if I was going to sit down and really concentrate on it, I think I would get a lot more about it. But I just didn't have the patience at the time that I was reading it to continue on with it. So maybe it is a book that I'll revisit at, at some point, because um, like I said, the, the structure for it I thought was really inventive. And there were some points and, and some sections where I felt really in it and really interested in it. but then as a whole, I just felt so lost that I, I just had to put it aside. Need to take a sip of tea. <laughs> okay, The Men by Sandra Newman. Uh, I want to start off by saying this is a beautiful cover. Uh, it is so gorgeous, this kind of gold foil and the, the figures outlined all throughout it. Um, it speaks so well to uh, the, the content of this book and it's just gorgeous to look at and kind of shine in front of my camera. But uh, the actual reading experience of it was quite uh, baffling in, in some ways uh, or I, yeah, I, I felt very mixed uh, about this book. Uh, so it begins uh, with a sort of global incident where everyone with a Y chromosome disappears suddenly from the earth. All of the men just disappear and uh, vanish and the women are left behind uh, wondering like what wait what happened and also because of you know, almost half of civilization suddenly disappearing, it creates a lot of disruption and problems and um, so structurally like society tries to keep itself together because uh, suddenly half the workforce and half the, the people um, living on the planet have just uh, have just gone and uh, so so it's it's a big like mystery like what why did this occur um, what happened and uh, it mainly follows like one character who was on a camping trip with her husband and son and um, then just suddenly her husband and son had vanished and uh, so you follow her journey uh, trying to, uh, to connect with other women that are left behind but it also follows the stories of several other characters and you're kind of introduced to them all in rapid succession in all their particular stories and uh, what's going on in their lives and then but it it mainly follows this this first character and also her relationship with this other strong-willed uh, uh, very charismatic uh, black woman that that comes to become a leader in this new society and 
and they have this whole secret past with each other and so it, it gets into the details of that and also yeah the very the very shocking ways that they had both become incarcerated at one point and uh, but then it threads in the stories of all these other women so there's a lot going on in this story and I think there's just a bit too much um, that it became a bit confused for me or uh, slightly the the direction of it wasn't didn't it didn't seem as well structured as as it should be or well organized as as it should be and also i'm not really sure what the overall message of this I and mean, what was she really trying to say in this book and and through having this uh this big worldwide incident uh, i don't know what if it really said anything very profound or interesting uh, about you know, gender or sexuality or the state of society or it, it, all of those issues. Um, I don't know if it added too much to that conversation. I mean, obviously, Sandra Newman wasn't, you know, trying to say the the world would be better if if, if everyone with the Y chromosome suddenly disappeared. Um, that would be far too simplistic, and that's been covered in a lot of books already. I don't think she was trying to do that. I mean, I think maybe what she was trying to do was to show that the the ways that uh, women's lives are influenced um, in different ways by men, or or really. Um, really know how much their their motivations or their ways in interacting with the world are predicated by their uh, relationship and understanding of, of men around them and living in a, in a largely patriarchal society. Um, I think maybe that's what she was saying, but then I don't know if that was explored in an interesting enough way, if, if that's what she was saying. Um, so yeah, I feel quite confused about this. I mean, I think Sandra Newman is a really fascinating writer. Um, her previous novel, The Heavens, I, I thought was really beautiful and moving. Um, that, that really struck me. Her novel, The Country of Ice Cream Star, was absolutely fascinating. I really admired it. Um, it's, it's, it was a really difficult book to, to read. I thought like just um, linguistically getting used to this like new language that's used in that novel, The Country of Ice Cream Star, um, and, and also in this kind of dystopian future, which is basically ruled by young people because there's a, a plague, which means that people, um, once they get into their early 20s, die. And so suddenly the lifespan of everyone is really shortened so they have to mature in a much faster way and um so yeah that that novel was absolutely fascinating though it was quite it took me a long time to read it was quite difficult um so so yeah she's a really interesting writer i'm just really not sure what she was trying to say in this book i might go and listen to some interviews um with her if she's talked about it because yeah i'd really like to understand what was her thought process but behind it but i'm also really looking forward to her next book because she is writing uh rewriting um the the story of 1984 but from the female character's perspective um rather than the male character that's primarily followed in that story um which i think is a really fascinating idea and uh kind of you know revising and, or re-looking at and giving a different version of george orwell's classic novel um i think that'll be great i think that might be coming out next year um so i look forward to that and reading more of her writing in the future but yeah i'm just not sure about this book but again beautiful cover. <laughs> I read a couple of non-fiction books, which is kind of unusual for me because I don't often read all that much non-fiction. Uh, but first off, I read uh, The Ruin of All Witches by Malcolm Gaskill, uh, which is subtitled Life and Death in the New World, uh, which I, I read because uh, it was shortlisted for this year's Wolfson History Prize, um, so a non-fiction prize, uh, which uh, I always enjoy following. And each year the, the prize offers to send me a book from their shortlist. And so I, I love getting suggestions of good new nonfiction that I, I should read. And so, yeah, it's the kind of book that I wouldn't ordinarily pick up right away, but I'm so glad I read this. It was a really enjoyable experience as well as a very informative one. And why it works so well for me personally is because I'm someone that primarily reads novels. Um, so as I was saying, not so much nonfiction, but this reads almost like a, a novel as well as um, really sticking to uh, factual 
experience from the past and, and the research um, that this author did uh, about this, this time period in the 1600s in New England in a small uh, colony in Massachusetts, um, so a small town that was forming at, at the time and uh, the people that had moved there were trying to make a new lives life for themselves there, uh, but also involves the, the whole hysteria around witches at, at that time. And he, he really focuses on that as a product of uh, this kind of clash between an old world ba view based on religious ideas and uh, superstition, and then a kind of more new world view, you know, based more around science and, and facts. And, um, and the tension between those two sort of created this perfect storm in the conditions of this New England uh, t time period in New England when um, people were really struggling to establish themselves there. It was a really hard life and there was a lot of uh, tensions um, not just between the colonizers and, and Native Americans but between the different colonizers that were living in these communities and the underlying uh, tension between you know even neighbors um, who had to rely on each other in a lot of ways but would also uh, have jealousy uh, between each other and there um, would be underlying conflicts there which would kind of come to the forefront in these accusations of witchery and it follows this uh, couple in particular uh, named Hugh and Mary and uh, how they became victims of this um, this sort of hysteria around witches and were accused by various members of the community of being witches and even accused each other and so how their relationship relationship just absolutely imploded um, because of this and following their their story and the drama of their story because these are figures which have been kind of lost in history but the author um, uncovered a lot of evidence and and all the the facts you could find out about this couple to reconstruct their story so it does kind of read like a novel in that way and it's also presented so the inside cover has these kind of reproductions of journal entries which I think are really beautiful but also it includes uh, a map of New England England at that time, but also a list of the principal characters. So you can follow the story like it is a, a drama and um, has descriptions of each of the, the primary um, individuals that are included in this story. So you can, it's much, it, I really appreciated that because, um, you know, a lot of these characters have like similar or kind of like bland names. So it, it was difficult at some points to keep them straight. So it was really useful to be able to flip back to, um, to read a description and remember, oh yeah, that's, that's who that person was and that's how they, they fit in. And yeah, and it's really tragic following how, you know, Mary most definitely was suffering from some mental illness or psychological conditions, which obviously weren't diagnosed at the time. And so she became a victim of it in that way, but also Hugh, he had a very difficult and abrasive personality which just didn't really fit in with the, the community in, in that time period and, and, um, and so wasn't able to integrate as well as he could have been and uh, and so then there were you know some absolutely ludicrous accusations by members of the community of kind of milk uh, turning a funny color or, or going a bit off or um, or a pudding um, failing to, to cook correctly in, in the oven and that's that was accused as as an example of witchery that was that was inflicted on on these people but it was also really interesting looking at the whole process of the the legal process of of how does someone become convicted of being a witch and then having to to follow um, through with uh, the the conviction so uh, that that was really factually interesting to um, understand about the the time period and uh, the circumstances of of this very extreme period and uh, yeah and so 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 interesting and uh, I just really enjoyed reading this book. I also read a biography of John Donne called Super Infinite The Transformations of John Donne by Catherine Rundell um, and this was such a fascinating biography. I've always been drawn to the poetry of John Donne, the, the, his kind of romantic sense and how he uh, really captures the, the physical experience of, of all of these emotions and desire. And uh, so I just really 
love his insightful poetry and and so as a teenager I was really drawn to it and I very pretentiously in my high school yearbook included a quote by John Tan in under my my photo in my my senior year yearbook but um yeah so uh it was so fascinating reading about um you know one of the great poets of uh English literature and one of the most fascinating facts I I discovered about his life and his writing um that I hadn't realized before that so little of his poems as we know them today came from his actual hand or 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 that we can attribute to um necessarily being directly what he had written because um he'd written so many poems but then kind of sent them pe- to people or or gave them away um as he was developing as as a poet rather than having them you know published and so the a lot of the the poems were kind of cobbled together over time and put together i mean they were recognized as as great works and so circulated and spread a lot but um probably were changed somewhat over over time and it was so fascinating how she she wrote about that and that that whole process and why that happened um cuz yeah it's it's just so unusual for us to to understand today of of a writer's work coming through um you know we sort of take that the the author you know was the person that actually wrote this but actually it's probably um a lot of his poems you know come together in different forms um so yeah that was really interesting but also he was such a fascinating figure and i love how she captures his personality while following the trajectory of his life and his many different as she says transformations through throughout his life because he was born into to um to well not into um poverty but into um a kind of precarious position he was born into a precarious position in his life um he was born um into a catholic family and um at the the time in in england um you know there were really big tensions between protestants and catholics and um and catholics were being persecuted in in a really horrible way and and often you know imprisoned or killed um for maintaining their beliefs and his a lot of his family really suffered because of that and he eventually converted to protestant tism and uh eventually became the dean of St Paul's Cathedral which was a really big thing at the time and she very dramatically uh describes um scenes where he would address uh the the community and and the nation basically from a big pulpit outside and huge droves of the community would come to listen to his sermons and his lectures um talking about a whole variety of issues and so he was very influential in in that way and had such a way with words and was so intelligent but also how you know we can't take anything that he wrote or said as directly he, coming from his own belief system because um she gets into this whole thing about how he would uh have this whole system of there or there is this whole system of writing at the time to do with like contradictions and and to to write uh Uh, sort of situations or or um thought exercises which included a lot of contradictions in them so didn't necessarily uh you know it's the the points he was making weren't necessarily his own and um and I think that's so interesting to to think about as well but also his romantic life and um and how you know you'd sort of assume from his romantic poetry that he would be this great lover um although he wasn't you know necessarily um, that or, or at least from what we can deduce from um the the facts of history as um Catherine Rundell um finds it uh, that yeah he probably wasn't that although he did have a wife and it was a very tumultuous relationship or at least at first like um this was a woman that um he uh was like of a higher class and um whose father disapproved of their relationship and he got into a lot of trouble because of it but then they um had went on to have many many children together um so uh but then he had also had a number of affairs most certainly and um so yeah following his very um tumultuous life and uh but was such a fascinating personality and I love how she captures his spirit in this book it, it was just wonderful reading about his life mediated through this very um intelligent and interesting author's perspective i read the trees by percival everett and what a fantastic uh intelligent thought provoking uh creative story this this is uh this kind of detective story following a number of crimes and murders which at first seem absolutely impossible or almost supernatural in in nature in that the body of a uh mutilated uh 
white man is is found alongside the the mutilated body of a black man and uh in mississippi in this small community and then a little bit later a body of another white man um again horrifically killed um with his testicles cut off clutched into the hand of the same black man that was found dead at the first crime scene and so you think at first like like well there must be something supernatural going on here and yeah there kind of is but it almost becomes more surreal in nature so the question of what is happening in reality isn't so interesting as the larger issues to do uh, with what is going on in these communities and this legacy and history of racism and lynching which is occurring in the the community and i i think he pursues this in a way which is somewhat similar to uh or at least it reminded me somewhat of uh uh, the the novel The Other Black Girl, which came out um, last year and uh, which similarly kind of tread the line between this reality and uh, an insurgent movement, uh, which was kind of going on uh, behind the scenes of, of the story. Uh, but then also there are kind of larger issues um, which are being addressed in, in the story to do with, with racism. And I thought it was so clever how he did that. I mean, how both those books did that, but how he does that in this story in particular to follow these, a number of different characters over a period of time and it gradually spreads out to uh, across the country to address different um, racial minority groups and, and different uh, people that have been persecuted over time in different instances of, of racism. Um, I thought that was really clever and engaging and uh, what this, this story is, is saying overall um, about uh, people who have been murdered and uh, a lot of names that have been forgotten and should be remembered. I mean, how that's memorialized in the actual text of, of the story of listing names of historic individuals um, that have been murdered in racist attacks in American history, uh, I, th I think is um, so well incorporated into this and makes a really important message in itself. But moreover, over. It's just such an engaging story and that in a lot of the dialogue is very funny. Um, there, there are a lot of like points um, to do with the names of the characters, which are very funny, or points to do with uh, there's a, a funeral home, which used to be a Dairy Queen. I mean, kind of little little details like that, or, or um, how at one point um, Trump enters into this and gum gets stuck in Trump's hair. And actually towards the end of the book, there's uh, he kind of mimics a, invents this, this Trumpian speech um, that he, he gives responding to these murders that are occurring across the nation in which eventually start to enter the White House and how he um, imitates that kind of Trumpian speech is so hilarious and so spot on. It's really well done. That comes towards the end of the book. It's just so good. And uh, so, um, I mean, yeah, I don't want to, to spoil too much about this book, but there's so much enjoyment and pleasure in it, as well as making really intelligent points and really functioning like a horror story as well. I mean, a lot of the murdered individuals are horribly mutilated, as were the black individuals in the past that were lynched and and killed in really horrific ways and so it's putting in your face a lot of these issues and and dealing with the, this trauma of the past and which is still continuing in the present um, as evidenced by the Black Lives Matter movement and um, so yeah it, it's such a clever and powerful novel but also such an engaging read and functions so well with these very short chapters that it just keeps the pace of the story going along in this wonderful way um, which I just found it so readable and was just gripped by so I'm really looking forward to this is the first novel I've read by Percival Everett but I know he's written a number of novels in the past I'm looking forward to, to reading some of this back catalog and exploring more of this uh, very uh, intelligent and artful uh, writer's work. The Swimmers by Julie Atsuka and this novel I think is so clever and powerful in how uh, I always admire books that uh, are able to convey so much emotion while not actually describing those emotions on the page so you can really feel the struggle of the characters in this, although it, it doesn't you know go into a lot of detail about their emotional state. Um, that is 
that is one of the, the greatest things about this book, and I think it is so powerfully done and really uh, evocative um, because of the, the facts of the experience kind of speak more than if these characters you know, were emoting and, and you were getting uh, little glimpses into their thought process and feelings. Um, you know, just reading the facts on, on the page um, says so much more about it. And also it's structured in such a creative and surprising way because at the very beginning of the book, you get this long section narrated in the collective we of a group of swimmers that come from all different backgrounds and have all different issues going on in their lives, but find this commonality in swimming in this, this underground pool um, that they attend and the kind of rules that they stick to and the, the nature of um, how they, uh, interact with each other in a very respectful way, uh, but and form this connection and kind of sub community with each other, um, even though it's not, you know, necessarily solidified there. Um, it even talks about how you, know, you might you might glimpse somebody on the on the in the outside world that you might know from this this swimming group. And there's almost this like quiet connection between you, but you don't necessarily, you know, you're not necessarily friends, you might not necessarily meet up and, and chat with each other in, in that way. And um, so how she forms this whole subset of, uh, of a community, I think is so clever and, and really interesting and, um, and shows how we, we find these small spaces in the world which kind of liberate us from our normal everyday life. And we, we see that as, as a release from you know, the everydayness of, of experience and, the, and all of the particular issues we're going through in our lives. And so it creates this wonderful commonality between the characters. And I think that's so well presented. And there is one figure of Alice who enters into the story um, that the, uh, the other swimmers are aware that she has memory issues. And then the book continues on to show her struggles with Alzheimer's. And, and I, I know that people should really be aware of that issue is addressed in the novel before going into reading it, because if it, that is something you are dealing with. Um, and, and I, you know, myself know somebody, um, well, that is, that is dealing with a family member, you know, that is going through this. And, and I, I said really plainly to her, like, I don't know whether I should recommend this book to you. It might be consoling in as a kind of touchstone in, in a way of of knowing, you know, the issues that are going through, but at the same time, it might be uh, too intense and, and alarming. Um, so I, I think you should be aware of that before going into reading this, but it does handle that subject matter in a really sympathetic and moving way. Um, again, moving because it just kind of goes into the facts of it. There's the lawn section, which is just um, Alice um, being given the rules of this new care home that she goes to live in, that her daughter places her in, and um, and rules that are obviously meant to protect the residents um, and and in their care for them, but are also you know inhibiting their their freedom and um, and so there's the whole tragic tension of of that that um, that they really want to care for these residents, but at the same time they're kind of being institutionalized and drawn into a system where all aspects of their personality and their their own personal freedom is 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 kind of wiped out and um and yeah that is really heartbreaking and sad um and you increasingly come to feel the the daughters dilemma of putting her mother in this place and uh, her very difficult connection um, trying to maintain a connection with her while losing her mother. Um, her mother is increasingly forgetting more things uh, about her life and um, so yeah I'm just getting so swept up and emotional just talking about it. Um, so yeah it's incredibly moving and powerful and I think she captures that experience so well and it's such a, a powerful statement she makes in this book but um, but again yeah I'd be cautious about whether to recommend this and um, and you should be aware that these are the issues that are talked about before going into reading it but again I would wholeheartedly recommend this book because I think it's it's brilliant. Whew, I just have to calm myself down and dry my eyes before talking about the next book, um, which is, uh, I'll only talk about briefly because I'm still reading it. I'm, I'm in the middle of reading Glory by No Violet Bulawayu, um, her new novel, which is so creative. It kind of, it's a play on Animal Farm in that it uh, 
it it fictionalizes an African nation and the um, and the the fall of a uh, kind of dictator leader um, who's been ruling the country for many years, and there's a coup and it makes way for this new society which might not be better than the old one and that is still wrestling with issues to do with its colonial past and um, so but all of the characters in it are different animals and um, so it is playing on George Orwell's Animal Farm in that way and at first I wasn't so sure like did it really need this structure and, and form um, that George Orwell used on it but actually it's I think it's working so well and it's really effective and it's making a very pointed message you know continuing on with George Orwell's message and incorporating into it a lot of issues to do that that we're facing in our society to um, do with social media and in this kind of like double speak of, of people saying things which don't mean what they actually mean and and that George Orwell handled a lot in his fiction and she picks up on that and takes a modern um, spin on that in such a fascinating way so I'm really enjoying this this book it is so uh, creative and um, and it's increasingly as I'm reading more of it it feels even more personal to the author herself I think she's kind of entering into it in a in a way which is quite like surprising and that I didn't expect um, and uh, that's me slightly making a presumption of, of that's the author entering this, but it kind of feels that way. It's suddenly from going to this like wide society view to this very personal view, um, I think is, is really powerful. So yeah, I'm really enjoying this and look forward to, to reading more of it. So those are all the books that I read or read part of in the month of June. But I'd love to know if you've read any of these books and or if you're interested in reading any of these books or if you want to tell me about any great books that you read in the past month. I'd love to know about that in the comments below. But hope you're doing well and reading good things and drinking calming cups of tea and coffee while doing your reading and I'll speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.